Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you Lori Edwards. She's with the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. She was born in Stoughton, Wisconsin, graduated from Stoughton High School, and then got her undergraduate degree in biology at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, and also her master's at UW La Crosse. Then she worked for the US Geological Survey, and about 16 years ago started at the State Laboratory of Hygiene. She, tonight she's gonna to talk with us about a rather sobering issue in Wisconsin, the issue of heroin and other opioids running through Wisconsin now. Is it epidemic with us and what can we do about it? Please join me in welcoming Lori Edwards to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Let's see if this works. Can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. And I'm going to tell you right now that I am not that funny. So. Uh, you got your chuckles in for the night. Um, the State Lab of Hygiene is your state public health lab. We have recently been um, adopted into the School of Medicine and Public Health here at, at UW. So I am very proud to represent the Forensic Toxicology section. A couple of my colleagues are here tonight. And a shout out to those who might be listening remotely. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the Forensic Toxicology section at the Hygiene Lab and tell you a little bit about what we do. Uh, and then the majority of my presentation, of course, is going to focus on heroin issue in our state, um, also other opioids in Wisconsin. It turns out this is not the only time in history where heroin has reared its ugly head. Um, it has a very interesting, I found, very interesting history um, originating from the opium plant. And so I'll include a little bit of information on the formation, the chemistry, and the metabolism of heroin and other opioids in the human body. And then the forensic challenges that we experience at the hygiene lab in trying to determine whether or not someone is um, driving under the influence of heroin or perhaps um, have died as a result of using heroin and other opioids. And then last, um, I'll try to keep on time, I have some case studies. And we find when we give presentations and doing training that people always enjoy to see the case studies. Um, some of it is sad and disturbing. I have a couple of videos to show you, and I'll warn you ahead of time that, that it can be a little um, upsetting. And also some scene investigations. So the toxicology section, this is a group picture of a very serious group of scientists. Uh, we've been testing in Wisconsin for over 30 years. Uh, we are certified by the American Board of Forensic Toxicology, which we pursued voluntarily. Um, this is a very prestigious accreditation for our laboratory, as we are one of the busiest laboratories in the United States and one of maybe only 35 labs in the United States that are accredited by this organization. Um, we test over 20,000 specimens every year, and, and you might be wondering what those specimens are. We test biological specimens for the presence of alcohol and drugs in operating while intoxicated cases. Um, in other words, drunk driving and driving under the influence of drugs. We also test specimens that have been submitted to the hygiene lab by Wisconsin coroner and medical examiners in death investigations. We receive well over 3,000 subpoenas per year because our data is often used uh, from a prosecution standpoint in um, litigation cases involved with people that uh, are arrested and prosecuted for OWI or drug driving, DUID. And we also give expert testimony in court. And I would say on average, our chemists probably testify two to three times per month. So this is an example of the workload just for OWI casework from 2003 to 2016. 
And in, in giving a title to my topic tonight, when I put the question mark, a Wisconsin epidemic, uh, because we are a public health lab, we are very concerned with things that affect our health. For example, flu epidemics. So I'll let you be the judge tonight to see if you think that the issues with heroin and driving is an epidemic and maybe even give some consideration to the bigger picture of just drug driving and driving under the influence of alcohol because that too is a public health concern in our state. You can see from this bar chart that we test well over 20,000 specimens per year, uh, starting to decline in about 2010. Um, we did have some administrative changes to manage our casework. But what I would like to also point out are the dark bars on this graph. That represents the proportion of cases that require drug testing. We always test alcohol first. If the concentration of alcohol exceeds the prohibitive alcohol in the state, which used to be 0 0.1 and now is 0 0.08, uh, we cancel drug testing if it's above that 0.1. Um, and there are some exceptions to that if there's a crash or a fatality or injury. But we continuously see the proportion of cases requiring drug testing increase. So for example, in 2003, approximately 7% of our cases required drug testing. And in 2016, that increased to nearly 30%. This is some data from a 2016 project that we worked on. Again, now here, um, these are individuals that were arrested for OWI. They had alcohol concentrations exceeding our 0 0.1 lab cancellation limit. So we did not perform drug testing. But in context of this project, we had received money from the Department of Transportation to go back and look at um, our random sample of drivers um, and look and see, are they driving with just alcohol alone? or are there drugs present? And you can see clearly from this graph that there are people driving not only with alcohol above a 0 0.1, but they have drugs present as well. And I would ask, does anybody want to guess what the number one drug we consistently see from year after year in our testing? Exactly, marijuana. Marijuana is number one and has been for a number of years. Um, but we do see the opioids in our top five, and that's really what my talk is going to focus on tonight. So this problem in our state uh, continues unabated. Uh, the Center for Disease Control estimated that the use of prescription opioids has quadrupled since 1999. And the heroin epidemic, if we decide that it is an epidemic, is very closely linked to prescription opioid abuse. The one thing we can't really determine is people that jump from prescription opioids to heroin, is it because they had valid prescriptions for those opioids or is it because they uh, got it through some diverted method? And, and that's an important concern because there are people out there that do have chronic pain management <coughs> issues and those are wonderful drugs when taken properly for controlling that and improving quality of life. We continue to see heroin listed as a suspected drug in our OWI casework, and we continue to have an increased number of people operating under the influence of drugs um, in addition to alcohol. And then of course, sadly, um, I'm sure you're all well aware in the news that we continue to have a large number of overdoses and deaths in our state. Uh, this data shows a graph from the Department of Health Services. The trend lines, uh, the gold is prescription opioid deaths between 2005 and 2014, and the blue line is the heroin deaths, um, the, pointing out the increase between 2013 and 2014 um, where we have a big jump. So it's continuing to climb. This is a, a map of 2015, a little bit more current, um, where we're seeing a big hot spot for overdose deaths would be in Milwaukee County and up the Fox River Valley. We continue to get a lot of cases uh, from Sheboygan County, Brown County, uh, both deaths and drivers under the influence of, of the opioids. 
And then here closer to home, this is from last spring. Uh, Sheriff Mahoney estimated that the city of Madison was going on about 12 to 15 overdose calls per week. And that, that's a lot of resources for our police department to be attending to. And if you factor in the, the cost to society, uh, the cost of the antidotes when they use the naloxone to try to reverse the opioid effects to try to resuscitate those people. And just a year ago, they had peaked with 70 calls in the month of April. So where is the heroin coming from? I wish they would talk a little bit about the news of trying to stop the supply because the law of economic supply and demand. Uh, it's most likely coming from Mexico through previous routes established by marijuana and the cocaine trade. Mexico is uh, number two in the world for producing heroin with Afghanistan number one. Uh, the quality of heroin coming from Mexico continues to improve and they can uh, harvest about 300 grams of the raw opium paste per day from their poppy fields in the mountains of Mexico. They have uh, poor Mexican farmers that the cartels control. Uh, they're not making any money, but the cartel is. And the main route into Wisconsin coming through Milwaukee, um, I've heard there is some coming through uh, uh, the Twin Cities as well, but Denver seems to be a big hub, hub for the transmittal of it into Wisconsin, according to the DEA. Um, we always like to get some interesting prices for some of these illicit drugs, and so uh, law enforcement um, are big resources for us at the hygiene lab. So a dub is a nickname for a hit, maybe a single use, which might cost you $20. Um, a hit is about a tenth of a gram. Uh, last pricing I heard was about $12 to $15 in Milwaukee. So a serious addict can be spending about $200 a day. And perhaps some of you saw the paper on Saturday where the young man was arrested from Sauk City and he told detectives that he was spending $300 a day on heroin, and in 2016, he estimated that he spent 70 to 80 thousand dollars on heroin, and the, I mean it's just astonishing. And as a comparison, um, very high-quality marijuana might cost about five to six thousand dollars a pound, and a gram of heroin might be 90 to 120. So if you do the voodoo math, it might end up to be uh, forty-five dollars to $50,000 for a pound of heroin that these um, drug dealers are making. So I found a lot of interesting trivia about heroin. Uh, the street grade is about 2 to 6% pure, but I keep hearing that the, the strength and potency is approaching 30% and higher, and that could be because of some of the other opioids that they're cutting it with that I'll talk about in a little while. Um, the most common old nickname for heroin is smack, and that's believed to come from the uh, Yiddish neighborhoods of New York in the early 1900s. Uh, some of our little slang in terms about goosebumps and cold turkey, those are slang from uh, individual responses to withdrawing from heroin or other opioids. Uh, the body has uh, lots of violent responses if you're going through withdrawal, so you get um, involuntary goosebumps or they refer to it as going cold turkey when they try to stop using the drug. It can cause very violent muscle spasms and hence the phrase kick the habit because when you're trying to quit, you're going to go through those violent withdrawals. And I just recently found out that heroin is legally manufactured outside the United States, I think in three countries, Australia, India, and Turkey, I believe. Um, and I'm not sure what their issues are there, but it's, we, we don't need it anymore in, in our state or our country. And all of this for that intense rush or high that they get, the addicts get, it really only lasts for a couple of minutes. So I think uh, hopefully over the course of my presentation tonight, you'll get a better understanding of why it is such a powerful, addictive class of drugs because once you get a little taste of that rush, you want more of it and so it keeps bringing you back for more. Uh, next series of slides are some slides from scene investigations. Uh, the lower left hand is uh, 
confiscated by DEA, and this is black tar heroin. Uh, it has a lot of impurities in it. It's very potent, but the impurities can cause a lot of problems in the users. But they have it formed in the shape of shoe soles to try to hide it for smuggling. Uh, the other picture shows uh, two different types of heroin that are cut with different agents. Uh, both of them, uh, quinine was detected in them, and then the lighter gray color that's more powdery had uh, lactose in it, which is milk sugar. Here's another scene investigation from Port Washington, Wisconsin. Uh, they have their, their kits. This is a, a flannel rum bag from alcohol. Uh, the tie-off, the little, the little plastic is the nugget of their heroin. And I'm sure that you will never look at those little tea light candles like the same again after you leave here tonight because that's what that is. And they put the heroin in there and they burn it so that they can dissolve it to shoot it up or smoke it. Uh, seizures in Dane County, this is a good example of someone that was probably dealing because they have their heroin packaged up into these foil balls. Um, another example of cutting it, uh, if you notice again, see how the color is lighter, the, that can be due to what they're cutting it with, but also it is associated with better quality and more potent. The lighter the color gets, um, the better quality the heroin is. We see it compressed into tablets, and that's true for some of the other prescription opioids. There are fake oxycodone tablets out there for sale. Here's one that I was astonished to see. The heroin is actually embedded into these lollipops. And so really, really devious way of, of smuggling it. Uh, it's very important when we do training with coroners and medical examiners because if they go on to a scene, uh, people that use these types of drugs, uh, family members will often clean up because it, it is, there's a social stigma with that, with IV drug use in particular. And they, they want to save their loved one from that embarrassment. So sometimes they clean up the scene and it's the only, till they get the toxicology report can they actually determine what they died from. So when they go in to investigate a scene, you, you want to keep that hairy eyeball on anything that might be a way to hide the drug. Here's another photograph. This is actually a close-up of tin foil. The heroin has been uh, burned onto the tin foil. It will uh, boil and turn into kind of a gelatinous ball, and then they use the flame to move it across the foil, and then they smoke it, and that's called chasing the dragon, and uh, one way to administer your, ho your heroin. So heroin has, is not, as I said, uh, new to this country. It's not uh, a drug that is, uh, no, it isn't any longer, let me rephrase that, for where you have the, the poor um, junkie that's in the alley. There are people, everyday professionals, that are using these drugs, and some of them can manage their addiction and function fine. Uh, when they start driving, that's when we get worried. So man's quest for pain management has a very long history. The, they have records, they have found records of the opium plant uh, as far back as 5,000 years ago with the ancient Sumerians. Um, the Chinese were big smokers of the o opium. They were trading the British for tea and the, they had opium wars over it when they tried to ban the import of the opium itself. In the early 1800s, the first extraction, the chemical extraction of the opium leading to a drug that we now know as morphine was performed. They named it morphine after the, god, the Greek god Morpheus, the god of dreams. So right away they were learning about the euphoric and sedating effects of this drug. And in those days, uh, the apothecaries that did these kind of extractions, they were experimenting um, and they would use the drugs on themselves and then write up what, how they would wake up hours later or um, they would sometimes um, give it to their pets or dogs to find out what would happen to them. So once they discovered the morphine, they, it wasn't too much longer that they were extracting other opioids from the opium plant, including uh, codeine that you, we all know that we can um, get from cough syrup because it has very great antitussive properties. Um, Thebane and papaverine, these are also from the opium plant, and we do see that in our testing and toxicology. 
And then finally, uh, people were using morphine religiously and people were getting addicted to it. And so in the effort to try to find something that was less addictive, uh, a chemist in Germany was boiling it in vinegar and lo and behold formed heroin. And so Tom's reference to the, the heroin is based on, on the, a German word meaning uh, great warrior or fearless uh, because you feel so good when you're high on heroin. So to start in grandma's garden, this is the example of the seed pod. Uh, my grandma had a huge garden of poppies in Stoughton and I was one of those kids that uh, liked to cut up the fish, I cut open the worms, I wanted to cut one of those seed pods open in the worst way and you were forbidden and now I know why. Uh, this is a great example of the vertical cuts that they make in that seed pod. That white exudate is actually raw opium paste and that naturally contains morphine and codeine. So this is uh, the top of Mother Nature's pharmacological superstore because there it is right there. Nobody made morphine up. It comes right from Mother Nature. Well, once they made heroin, uh, the bear company jumped on that and were marketing it. They were producing metric tons of it and marketing it for anything from uh, treating children when they're cutting teeth or uh, ladies days, women's monthly ladies days, and pretty soon uh, lots of people are getting addicted to it. Uh, there were many soldiers coming home from the Civil War that were addicted to morphine because they were mixing it into laudanum, which was alcohol and morphine. So I can't even imagine what kind of buzz you'd get on that because I think it was like 70% ethanol mixed in with the morphine and you could just go to your pharmacy and buy it in the bottle. Uh, and in 1914, the United States got on board and they actually banned heroin in the United States. So a little bit about how they form morphine. Uh, here's another example of the seed pod from the flower. Uh, this, this sap has been allowed to come out of the pod and it has oxidized so it's a little bit darker and it firms up a little bit so they can scrape it off with these tools and the lower picture shows the actual raw opium paste that will be processed into heroin. So remember the morphine is naturally in that opium paste. Um, you can acetylate it with something as simple as vinegar. And these, the, the things I want to just point out here for if there are any geeky chemists in here, these hydroxyl groups, the OH, oxygen and hydrogen, are what we're going to change to get our heroin. Uh, water is H2O, so they're just one hydrogen short. We acetylate them and then it changes the structure. So now we have those two acetyl groups and we've changed our morphine to diacetyl morphine or what we now know as heroin. So here's some nice uh, photographs of grades of heroin. Uh, the nastier it is, the lower the number. So number one and two is, is just, just after the uh, heroin production process. So there's a lot of junk in there and people can use this and get high on it, but it has a lot of consequences. They can get skin infections and things from it because there are so many impurities. Uh, number three is getting better. This is uh, brown sugar, which um, the, my favorite rock and roll band, the Rolling Stones, I always thought that song was about an interracial relationship. And now I know that it's not because they have many songs that allude to the use of heroin and sister morphine. And then finally, the creme de la creme would be the China white. And so that would be here, this white powder here. That is heroin hydrochloride. It's water soluble. It, it has the highest potency and gives you the best buzz. Um, but the dealers want to make money, so they cut it with things. Uh, sometimes they cut it, they whack it, they stomp on it to increase their profit margin. Sometimes some of the things they cut it with have a purpose. For example, uh, diphenhydramine is the active ingredient in Benadryl or over-the-counter sleep medications. And when you use heroin or other opioids, even prescription pain medicines, sometimes they cause itching because it causes a release of histamine in your blood, and that is an antihistamine. So my theory is maybe they're trying to um, lure people into thinking that, ooh, this is really good, I don't get itchy, I don't get that one <coughs> annoying side effect. 
Uh, scopolamine would be the kind of um, antihistamine that is in the patches for motion sickness. Um, some of these other things, common caffeine, sugar, uh, lactose, and even dried milk. I mean, these are, they're, they're adding weight to their product so they can make more money. But last and certainly not least is fentanyl. And fentanyl has been in the news along with some of its chemical variations. And we see heroin cut with this, and we are seeing fake heroin out there that is fentanyl. And it is deadly. And we will, um, I will tell you why. Uh, this is a uh, graph from Dr. Alan Wayne Jones, who is a retired toxicologist in Sweden. Um, just want to quickly go through. So again, we're going to start at the top with our raw um, plant material from the poppy plant. It gets acetylated. We get our heroin here. Once the heroin is ingested in the body, whether however you administer, whether you're smoking it, snorting it, um, it is going to rapidly convert to the 6-monoacetyl morphine. There we go. And this is really the smoking gun in forensic toxicology. That's what we see in our testing, and that's what we look for and confirms that heroin was used. Uh, your liver does a lot of work to try to metabolize these drugs, and once they metabolize, they all will all ultimately convert back to morphine because that's our mother structure. Uh, the human body will try to get rid of this, and so we try to make it water soluble. It will um, glucuronidate the forms of morphine and basically add sugar structures to them so they could be eliminated in the urine. So I kind of went back from heroin and opioids. Um, opioids are really any chemicals that can act on the receptors that we have in our central nervous system and in our gastrointestinal tract. Uh, if you have ever had to use a prescription opioid for, say, a surgery, uh, one of the side effects can be constipation, and that's because of the central nervous system depression. It slows down the peristaltic actions in your GI tract, um, but now they have medication for that, too, that I see advertised. So if you have the uh, opioid-induced constipation syndrome, you can get another medication for that. Um, the natural opiates, again, are going to be the morphine and codeine that I've already talked about. Uh, Semi-synthetic opioids are going to be some that have been modified by man based on that natural uh, morphine structure, and those are common ones that, that you have heard before, hydrocodone, which is Vicodin, um, oxycodone, uh, buprenorphine. I'm, I don't know if you've heard of that. You might recognize it as Suboxone. Um, this is a drug currently used to help treat addicts to recover from heroin addiction. And then here's our diacetyl morphine, so heroin is a semi-synthetic. Fentanyl and is considered um, fully synthetic, that is a man-made chemical. And when I'm talking about the heroin being cut with fentanyl, this is not pharmaceutical fentanyl that might be in a pain management patch for someone that could be in a terminal stage of cancer or some serious illness where they need chronic pain management around the clock. This is illegally manufactured fentanyl, um, which China is our number one source of that right now. And the reason we have, as um, we talked about on uh, a couple minutes before the presentation started that we have these receptors in our, our body because we have our own natural um, opioid type chemicals, neurotransmitters, endorphins and encephalins. And so they, they help us manage pain. Um, they, if you burn your finger on the stove, uh, your body will respond to that and try to mitigate that pain and interrupt those signals. So the users of heroin uh, their biggest thing is that euphoria, but we know that it's very short-lived. Uh, it has the analgesic effect because it interrupts those pain signals through the nerve endings, and so we get analgesia, and because of that, it can make you very relaxed and feel very carefree, um, very apathetic to your surroundings, and because you're very relaxed um, and very sedated sometimes, uh, some people like it because it has that anti-anxiety component to it. But long-term use of it can have many negative effects. It's very hard on your organs. Uh, there's not only the physical addiction, but there's a powerful psychological addiction because uh, you crave it. You crave it, you want that euphoria. 
Uh, that euphoria has been described from uh, interviews that I have seen with addicts as almost a sexual experience, and so hence that very powerful um, draw to get more and more of it. They're always chasing that euphoria. Uh, it can cause nausea and vomiting, and, and prescription opioids can cause that too. Some people might say they're allergic to codeine because it made them throw up, but it's not really an allergy, it's just a response to that drug. Um, skin abscesses, and that can come from using injections. Uh, we've already talked about the constipations and some of the effects of withdrawal. Um, if you inject your heroin, you're putting yourself at risk not only for um, the heroin effects, but bloodborne pathogens. And again, that is a public health concern for all of us. Here's a little cartoon that kind of um, adds a little humor to withdrawal. Um, it really, uh, I've read that it's similar to having a terrible bout of the flu, but again, in interviews with addicts, they, they, they just find that offensive because they find it more, much more violent than surviving the flu. Um, and it can take uh, maybe 14 days of withdrawal before these symptoms go away or these side effects. Uh, the addicts, they know how long they can go before they need another fix. Um, it might only be hours before they go start to have signs of withdrawal, and they don't want that. And so hence it leads us into that issue with finding the money to get another fix for it. So routes of administration, um, injection is the best way that you can get high. You mainline, you do a direct dump. Um, if your veins are starting to get scarred, you can do something that's called skin popping. So you see in this right-hand picture uh, these nasty abscesses, abscesses on this individual's arms. That's from um, skin uh, uh, shooting it underneath the skin, if you will. Uh, you can also snort your heroin. Um, it has to be chopped up. Um, people can, um, if you get the water-soluble kind, you can dissolve it in water and aspirate it in your sinuses. Uh, like nasal, nasal spray, they call that shebanging. And there are nicknames for everything. I mean, there's probably 20 nicknames for drugs combined with heroin. For example, speedball, heroin, and cocaine. That's famous for anyone from my generation that remembers John Belushi. Uh, or uh, Chris Farley, unfortunately, I believe, also passed away from speedball. If you smoke your heroin, you have to burn it like that tinfoil picture we saw earlier. Um, it's called chasing the dragon. So the smoke, when, when it gels up and starts to burn, it emits this smoke and they snort that up in a straw. And then one extreme um, use or way to administer your heroin could be from what's called plugging. And sometimes the, the use of these drugs, especially intravenous use, is a very private thing. Um, they don't want people to see their arms. They wear long sleeves when it's 95 degrees out. Uh, plugging is a way that if you don't like needles and you don't want anybody to know, um, you administered your heroin either anally or vaginally, and those areas of your body are highly vascularized so the drug can be absorbed very quickly. Here's a classic example of track marks. Um, this is what law enforcement looks at when they pull someone over and they look like they're under the influence of heroin. Uh, sometimes they can document that there are track marks. Um, I've heard it estimated that one inch of track mark is worth about 50 to 60, or excuse me, 50 to 100 injections. So once that person is stopped and the blood is collected, the blood will come to the hygiene lab, and here starts the forensic challenges. Um, heroin, because of those two acetyl groups that I talked about, is not very stable once it enters the human body. In fact, it's very unlikely that we would ever measure heroin in a living person. It gets converted to that metabolite that I mentioned, 6-monoacetylmorphine, um, in just a few minutes. Uh, we call it 6-MAM for short. And this is, if we detect this in our toxicology mm -hmm. testing, this is definitive evidence that heroin has been used, whether it's in a driver or in a death investigation. So this is just a quick chart to show uh, how 
stable or unstable, depending on how you look at it. If you use heroin, we would expect to see that 6-MAM metabolite, but we will also see some morphine and codeine because remember it's coming from the opium plant. Um, we can look at that morphine coating concentration ratio and studies have shown that when that ratio is greater than one that is indicative of heroin use even if we didn't see the 6-MAM. Uh, the half-life of the 6-MAM is only about a half an hour. So we can detect it maybe for a couple hours in the blood. In Wisconsin for OWI arrest, uh, the try to collect the blood within a three hour window that's considered prima facie evidence of driving under the influence at the time of driving. So if they can get the blood quickly and it's analyzed in a timely fashion, we have a higher likelihood of confirming the presence of 6-MAM. And just a little bit about some of the other opioids, particularly fentanyl. Uh, I personally and my colleagues believe this is much worse. It's difficult to see in our toxicology testing. We don't see it as easily as the natural or semi-synthetic opioids. Uh, it's about uh, 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. Uh, we use morphine sort of as our measuring stick because that's Mother Nature's original recipe. They don't get as much euphoria from that. The onset is very rapid and it has a very short duration of action. Uh, the, again, this type of fentanyl is coming from China. Uh, those chemists are better chemists than I'll ever be. Uh, they, they are making all different kinds of versions of fentanyl and people are buying it thinking they're getting heroin. Uh, they might use their usual dose or hit that they think and unknowingly because the fentanyl is so uh, powerful, it can induce an overdose or even death. Now even and because of that strength, if they do get caught in time and someone calls 911 to try to save them, they can give them naloxone, but again because it's so powerful, oftentimes they have to administer multiple doses of naloxone. Uh, naloxone for an injection costs about $60. Uh, state, uh, the city of Madison was using uh, some, ex was getting expired naloxone from drug companies to try to save resources because of the expense. So for 150 people, they might have given 250 doses of naloxone. So, you know, not only is it a public health concern, but, but it, it's a societal um, concern because of the finance and resources that, that go to um, treat this and try to save people. Here's an example of some of the easy chemical modifications they can make on fentanyl. So the fentanyl structure, I have it stretched out here kind of in a long fashion. This little group right here, just think of these as pieces of Lego. This is fentanyl and all they do is just modify it very quickly. Here they've taken off one methyl group, here they've added on extra, and now we have forms of fentanyl, again, coming largely in part from, from China. And these are, these are, we're always chasing, trying to keep up so that we can detect these in our casework. Sometimes people, um, they, we turn in a, a not detected toxicology report and the law enforcement agency will call us or a district attorney will call us and say, how can that toxicology report be non-detect? That person was wasted on narcotics. And we have to go back in and start looking for these and, and sometimes we find them and sometimes we don't. Carfentanil is well beyond um, anything that fentanyl can in and of itself cause in terms of uh, frightening public health concern. Uh, this is a extremely powerful large animal sedative used in veterinary medicine. Uh, they dress up in hazmat when they use this. Uh, one drop can be fatal. You can see the, the proportion picture here of the penny and that's about a spot of fentanyl that would be lethal. Uh, it is 10,000 times the potency of morphine, remember, that's going to be our measuring stick. Uh, the first use that I heard of it was in 2002. It was uh, dispersed in aerosol form in a Moscow theater where some Chechen dissidents had taken hostages. Uh, the Russian government, because it killed everybody, the, the people they were trying to save as well as uh, the perpetrators, 
but they wouldn't disclose what it was. And sometime later, years later, there was a scientific paper published where they actually tested some of the clothing and they identified the chemical as carfentanil. So it is a very frightening possibility if this ever got in the wrong hands and could be used as a weapon of mass destruction. Supposedly, in last month, China has announced that they have banned exports of carfentanil. But just this week, yesterday, uh, the Milwaukee County medical examiner was in the news because they have confirmed their first death to carfentanil in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it, it, it get, it's very, very upsetting because there is no antidote that can save you from this drug, and, and now it's in our state as well. Here's an example of hazmat cleanup. Um, you can see they're wearing um, all the protective gear. And if law enforcement comes upon a scene or arrests somebody where car fentanyl might be there, they bring in the canine dogs. And, and that puts them and the animals at risk. So now this is, again, another huge amount of resource. They have to assume the worst. So they have to get geared up for and be prepared in case there is a drug like this present in their cleanup. So what does it look like when you're driving under the influence of heroin? If law enforcement pulls you over because you aren't driving very well, uh, they're going to look at your vision. Uh, they're going to talk to you and see how you respond to questions. Uh, they're going to ask you to perform some divided attention tasks. Uh, these are what we call standardized field sobriety tests. They're actually standardized on alcohol, but they are very useful tools for law enforcement to recognize when somebody is impaired. Um, impairment can be caused by over-the-counter medicines. It can be caused by prescription medicines. A valid prescription from your doctor does not mean that you're safe to drive. But with heroin, some of these certain drug categories, law enforcement can recognize some very um, very pronounced clues that can give them indicators. Uh, we have specialized trained law enforcement called drug recognition experts and they are trained to look at clinical and psychophysical um, indicators and give opinions on one of seven drug categories that you might be driving under the influence of. So with heroin and other opioids or narcotics, uh, they look at uh, pulse and blood pressure and your temperature. Uh, these, because these drugs are central nervous system depressants, it's gonna slow your pulse down. And I have uh, what would be expected an average of 60 to 90. Everything gets slowed down. Your blood pressure is slowed down. Your body temperature drops. Um, here's uh, two standardized field sobriety tests, so your balance and coordination are not very good. You sway, they look at something called the Romberg test, where, excuse me, they're looking at how your body just, you can't maintain your position. And so if you think of driving, you, that is a divided attention test because you're looking, you're responding to the road, you're accelerating or braking. Um, your body clock is very slow, so your ability to respond to something is very slow, um, and your muscle tone is very flaccid when you're under the influence of heroin. We had our first confirmed uh, heroin metabolite in a driver in 2013, so my colleague Stephanie Weber and I have been kind of on the detective trail ever since. So this is an example of hygiene lab data from 2012 to 2015. Once we started seeing some of the heroin metabolite, we went back and thought, well, what about that morphine codeine ratio? How, how many people out there might be under the influence of heroin? And we, we just couldn't tell that in our testing. Uh, so we had well over 900 individuals that had at least morphine and morphine codeine with the ratio greater than one, so 270 out of that subset. And only 15 of them were we able to confirm that six monoacetyl morphine, but this, it's probably underestimating the number of people that are actually driving, and again, because it's very short-lived in the body, so our ability to detect it is very reduced. When you're driving on smack or heroin, uh, when we talk about how it affects your vision, it causes your pupils to be constricted. Uh, many of the individuals that we have seen in the hygiene lab driving on heroin, confirmed heroin cases, uh, many of them were driving during the day. And if you think about your pupillary response to light, uh, the DREs look at your pupils in room light, 
uh, direct light with a flashlight, and near total darkness. And these drugs will constrict the pupils and you will have little to no reaction to light. So if you can imagine driving at night in the country where there are no street lights, your pupil needs to open up, probably nearly filling your iris, so you get as much light as possible in there to see what you're, where you're going. And that can't happen when you're under the influence of heroin. It also causes something called ptosis or droopy eyelids. Uh, they have a really hard time of keeping their eyes open. Uh, they are very sedated, and so that's part of it. So now your pupils aren't open, and your eyes lids aren't, are, you're having trouble keeping your eyes open. Um, here's just a little video of an actual, let me see if that's going to work. Well, it shows the pinpoint constricted pupils in darkness. So you see the little lights there? That's actually the size of that person's pupils. And it should be all black from the pupil open in, in full darkness. Um, one of the other vision tests that the officers look at is lack of convergence. Uh, we all, most people I should say, not all, but can cross our eyes if you look at your nose. Um, there are some drugs out there that um, prevent that from happening. Heroin is not one of them, but that is one of the checks, the eye checks that the officers can look at. Let's see if this, I don't think this video is going to work either. So this is another video of the droopy eyelids. Wait, here we go. All right, let's pass on that one. All right, this is the last video that I hope is going to work. Uh, this is, we see this in um, narratives from law enforcement in their documentation of the stop or when we're preparing for court testimony, something that they call on the nod. Uh, they alternate between a state of um, awake and sleep. You might think that they are asleep. They, they can hear you, but they're just kind of out of it in la-la land because they're stoned. And uh, this, if you see someone at the stoplight that they're either slumped over their steering wheel or their heads flopped back, just keep your car away from them and call 911 because if they're on the nod, they're under the influence. Um, this is the video that is, can be a little bit disturbing. Uh, this young lady is high on heroin. Luckily she's not driving, she is on a public bus, but what is disturbing about it is that her child is with her and her daughter is trying to attend to her. So let me see here. So that's what we call on the nod. And that's her daughter trying to straighten her up. And, and if you can imagine someone driving a car like that. We've seen uh, fewer uh, heroin in driving and my personal belief on that is perhaps because uh, the distribution of heroin is spreading throughout our state and I think it's getting easier to to buy it and so they don't have to drive as far. I, I'm not sure, I, I mean I can't prove that, but that, that is one of my suspicions. So that's better if they're not driving. But So let's see, I think I have time to go through some case histories. Um, I call this gentleman the jack of all trades. He was just stopped in the middle of the road. He stopped driving, he said he was tired. Uh, the officer immediately observed the pinpoint pupils. He had a slow, raspy speech, which is another characteristic of um, being uh, under the influence of heroin or another opioid. He had those droopy eyelids. Um, the officer also found some interesting paraphernalia in his car, and one thing I've learned about um, addicts as such as this, they are very creative in how they hide their paraphernalia and how they describe what its use is. So for example, he had a scale in his car which might imply that maybe he was a dealer. Um, he told the officer that his brother is a professional dart thrower and so that is a scale that he uses to weigh his dart tips. The razor blades were used to cut his mother's pills because he takes care of his mom and he has to cut her pills up for him. But they found baggies of a powder in there which could have been heroin or it could have been the crushed pills. He did claim that he was in a pain management program so he might have had a little bit too much of his medicine that day. 
and he had tinfoil bindles, which again might be a clue for someone that is selling. Um, he said that those pieces of tin foil folded up were used so that when he moves furniture around, it helps it slide easier. <laughs> and uh, we've heard of uh, the, them hiding their syringes. They load their syringes so they have them with all the time because, again, they know how long they can go before they need that fix. They will pull apart the steering column in the cars. I don't know if you can do that with the new cars now with all the computer, but they would hide the syringes in the steering column. Uh, so he, we, he was arrested as blood was drawn. The hygiene lab tested it, and lo and behold, we have morphine, codeine, and 6-MAM. Uh, the morphine codeine ratio, if you notice, is much greater than 1. So that confirms um, heroin because we have our heroin metabolite. And we did find some oxycodone, another opioid, and alprazolam. So likely he was probably crushing those oxycodone. Uh, that was a huge problem for a while. People like to crush them and snort them. And... Um, in 2010, Purdue Pharma had to, got a lot of pressure to make a crush-proof version, and when they put it in water to try to snort it, it turned into this gelatinous mess. So uh, he might have still had some of the old formulation there. Alprazolam is another central nervous system depressant. It's in a big family uh, that you might be familiar with, with it, known as Xanax, and Valium is in that family. This person also was having problems parking. Another uh, male who was found uh, passed out in his car, he was partly in the parking lot and partly on the street, and the, his rear part of his car was hooked up on the front bumper of the car behind him. And he just said, I was tired from parking and wanted to take a nap. Um, he did admit that he had used heroin earlier that day. Uh, the officer saw the, the indicators of impairment, and he was uh, very, very sleepy and sedated. He fell asleep numerous times through, uh, throughout the interview and the rest process. Um, he did demonstrate lack of convergence. So if you remember um, the ability to cross your eyes, what that looks like is you might have one eye that looks like a lazy eye. It'll just, the eyeball will roll off into an odd direction. And that can happen with uh, marijuana. So when we tested his blood, um, we did find the morphine coating and the 6-monoacetylmorphine, the heroin metabolite again. And then we also found uh, the marijuana metabolite, carboxy-THC, which just is indicative of that sometimes he had smoked. Um, it's, it's not what's considered the restricted controlled substance. That has to be the parent Delta-9 compound, which is also illegal to drive um, under in the state of Wisconsin. This person, a uh, young lady, she was called in by several civilians because she was driving all over the road very slow. Uh, the officer knew right where her car was because all the traffic was held way back, driving slow, and she was in front going from one side of the highway to the other. And she, she was very upset when he finally got her to stop. She was really shy. She didn't want to open her arms to show him. I um, he could tell she was on heroin. This was an experienced officer, and she cried. She had been clean for several months and had fallen off the wagon that day. And when she was going through her arrest process, the female officer found that she had her syringes um, hidden in the groin area. And again, morphine, codeine, and 6-MAM. At 53 nanograms of 6-MAM per milliliter of blood, that is huge, I can tell you. Uh, so that tells us that she probably had used the heroin very close to the time of driving. I think this is our one of our last cases. Uh, this person just had the unfortunate uh, luck of merging on the highway and a police officer was behind her. She was not having problems maintaining her lane position. Um, he did smell alcohol and her eyes looked watery and, and glassy, bloodshot, which alcohol can cause. She had a lot of issues with balance and coordination, so she had a lot of clues on the field sobriety test. She flat out denied that she drank, didn't do drugs, nothing. Again, we found morphine, codeine, and 6-MAM, and she did have a little alcohol on board. Um, uh, just below a 0.05. And then there's that diphenhydramine that we talked about. Uh, 
it's very, we do consistently see it in our testing. We don't always report it because it's very small amount. So again, it could be used as a cutting agent. And then last but not least, this is what I call a polyopioid case because this person had, had a couple different types of, of possibly heroin. Uh, this was during the daytime, so 4.30 when people are out and about, you might be getting finished from work. Our work day ends at 4.30 at the hygiene lab unless we're out traveling for court. Uh, this, the officer that arrested this person just happened to be a drug recognition expert and this subject was very casual, not worried. Um, he showed clues of uh, poor balance and coordination, the constricted pupils, um, only morphine but this time fentanyl. So we can't say for sure if he had used heroin because we don't have that, that six man metabolite, but the fentanyl in and of itself would be enough to cause impairment. So Wisconsin is taking action. Uh, we have the prescription drug monitoring program. So if you do get prescription medication from your doctor, it is tracked to make sure that people are not going from doctor to doctor getting multiple prescriptions. Uh, we have the Good Samaritan law that was just recently updated in 2016. So if a person um, is with someone that overdoses because they like to get high with their friends, um, they won't just take off and leave them. Because we've seen deaths many times where someone is just found in the car and lo and behold, their buddies were with them and they passed out and got afraid and left. So, um, or if they're on probation, uh, with the, the whole purpose of this Good Samaritan law is so that people will call them and hopefully they can get 911 help and resuscitate them with the antidote. Uh, this is a very important one uh, that the hygiene lab was uh, very, played a prominent role in happening, happening in 2016 that the heroin metabolite was finally listed in Wisconsin as a restricted controlled substance. And that means it is illegal to drive with, her with the heroin metabolite in your body. Heroin itself was already listed, but we aren't going to see that in living subjects, very unlikely, so that was very important. Uh, we continue to have more and more naloxone training, so uh, paramedics, teachers, uh, family members that of known addicts, they can get training on administering the antidote and hopefully save their loved one. And then the legislature has taken some action. There is a task force on opioid abuse. I believe that the lieutenant governor is uh, in charge of that. And, and hopefully this month the legislature is supposed to vote on a $4.8 million, which uh, covers about 11 different bills addressing this issue. So I don't know if you would think this is an epidemic, but it is definitely a public health crisis in our state, and people driving under the influence of heroin is basically a homicide in action, uh, in my opinion, because if they can't control their vehicle, that puts all of us at risk. Um, the abuse of opioids continues unabated in Wisconsin, and again, it's very unlikely that we will ever detect heroin in blood of a live person, so if we get that metabolite, that gives us conclusive evidence, um, both for litigation and for interpretation that they used heroin. Uh, we have um, consistently see the poor driving and how it affects your ability to operate a motor vehicle safely. Um, those are very impaired by the use of heroin and other opioids. The time intervals are very critical. Um, law enforcement does a fantastic job. They get, they get that blood collected very quickly and, and it is incumbent upon the laboratory to get it tested promptly so that we can identify those drugs before they degrade in the blood. And then again, uh, the increase in naloxone training throughout our state is hopefully going to save more and more people in the future and, until we can uh, get control of this problem. So it's time for questions. Um, this is my contact information too. If anyone wants to um, send an email or contact the hygiene lab. Um. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I don't. 
Oh, yes. Um, her question was uh, wondering if we have treatment centers for drug addiction in the city of Madison, and I'm sorry that I don't know that answer. I think that is one of the issues that the resources, if that bill is passed by the legislature, that there are going to be resources allocated. They have money allocated for uh, special schools for young students that are recovering addicts. Uh, they have money in there for teacher training. Um, addiction treatment is very, very expensive. Uh, the drugs that they use for treatment, uh, the Suboxone or Buprenorphine, um, it is very expensive. There are methadone clinics in the city of Madison, so if you can get into um, a methadone treatment clinic, that is one way that um, it can curb those cravings. Um, I have um, a family friend that has a child that is a recovering addict, and this person did not like being on methadone because it made them feel really, he described it as being wasted all the time and he didn't feel comfortable driving. In fact, there's a methadone clinic very close to the hygiene lab and methadone uh, can be very dangerous in and of itself uh, and we see drivers that are impaired by it but uh, it's, it's a problem to get treatment and it really comes down to money. She asked if the Tellurian Institute still exists. I've heard of it, but but I I can't answer that question. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Would you please uh, comment on the uh, possibility of having uh, genetically modified opium? And uh, your comment on newspaper articles on some medicine called tramadol. Um, he asked if I would comment on uh, <coughs> genetically altered forms of opium, opium. or the poppy, poppy, opium, plant, opium. poppy plant, and then also comment on the drug tramadol. Yeah, you see the articles. Yes, that there are articles in the news about tramadol. Uh, tramadol is, is also a narcotic. It's used for uh, pain management. Uh, it's... We, we do see people abuse that drug and therefore are impaired with respect to driving. We, we don't see it a lot in casework in terms of overdoses, not that it doesn't happen. Uh, I, I think that it's less risky for pain management and less addiction liability leading you to something stronger like heroin than perhaps the oxycodones and the hydrocodones are. Um, but that would be just my, my personal opinion from the research that I do. Uh, we do see it in our casework, but, but not nearly as much as we do uh, the other opioids. As far as the genetically altered poppy plant, um, just because we could do that doesn't mean we should. Uh, and it's probably possible. Um, just the example of what's happening in China, they're making all these um, synthetic versions of prescription pain medicine all the time and uh, we, we, can't, we can't control it. So uh, that's, that would be a very scary proposition. If, uh, and I had heard somewhere that it was illegal to grow poppies in Wisconsin. Has anybody ever heard that? Did your grandma get busted? No, she did not. And one whole, her whole length of her property was full of poppies. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, Tom had a wonderful write-up in the cover for, for tonight's um, introduction, and, and it, it, it is the, the flower of remembrance. I mean, we buy the little paper poppies um, for Veterans Day. Uh, she asked if the opium poppy is different no, than it is. It is. You're you're telling me. Yeah, there is the opium poppy. Okay. Which is not like the poppy that you get at the you know you can buy poppies at Home Depot right at this moment. 
Oh, okay. Well, then perhaps that answers your question. So it, maybe they're making genetic modifications for the good then. So it reduces That's what I mean. uh, okay, the amount of, of sap and the, the morphine and codeine in there. I right away was going to drug, drug dealing and drug manufacturing. So thank you for that, that clarity. Uh, yes, sir. Well, the workhorses in our lab for drug, oh, the question is what kind of equipment do we use in our laboratory? Uh, the workhorses in a forensic toxicology lab are gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. Uh, we use variations of that for testing for alcohol um, because those are very volatile chemicals, but the GCMS, we call it for short, is um, those are our workhorses. We really would like to, we, we do need to upgrade our instrumentation in our lab in order to stay current with all the new novel psychoactive drugs that are out there. Um, we have just some of the same instruments that they use in clinical laboratories for screening for the presence of drugs like enzyme immune assay or ELISA. Some of you, if you've come from the medical, um, you might be familiar with those. So they give us uh, positive or negatives for classes of drugs, let's say for marijuana or cocaine, for example. Uh, but what we what we really need is uh, uh, we use uh, LC mass spec, mass spec. Um, we have one of those instruments, um, and we really rely on them uh, to keep our turnaround time down as well, because that is critical for us to have the ability to detect some of the drugs. It has to be tested in a timely manner. Yes, Tom. Oh, well, yes, ma'am. Um, if it needs to be tested in a timely manner, are there other labs throughout the state that can do this testing? Since, you know, if it's up in northern Wisconsin, that's a Sure. Uh, the majority of the OWI specimens are sent to the hygiene lab. Uh, the crime lab does, we have several crime labs in the state of Wisconsin, and they do some testing, um, but only for felony cases. So anything that is not a felony traffic related event has to come to the hygiene lab. So we, we have a huge testing, testing burden on us um, that really taxes our resources. As far as other laboratories, uh, we sometimes use laboratory services outside the state of Wisconsin. Very sad to have to say that, um, but again, it's because we don't have the testing capabilities for some of these new uh, novel psychoactive compounds. For example, the synthetic cannabinoids, when you hear about uh, the, the spice and things that they're buying at the, the gas stations around Madison that was in the news a few months ago. Uh, those are chemicals that are supposed to be not for human consumption, um, but they, we, we can't see them in our testing and we don't have the ability to even develop methods for it. So they have to be sent out of the state. Yes, ma'am. Is blood drawn for these drugs on site by law enforcement? The question is whether uh, the blood from these individuals are collected by the law enforcement at the site or when they go to jail. Uh, what happens with the arrest process is the officer will perform the field sobriety evaluation at the roadside, provided that it's safe and the weather is cooperative. Then they will take them to somewhere where the blood can be drawn by a medical professional. Um, someone that has, is operating under the direction of a physician that could be a registered nurse, that could be a trained phlebotomist. Uh, my very first laboratory job was as a phlebotomist, so um, I have drawn a lot of blood um, for cases myself. And once the, the kits that they actually use are provided by the hygiene lab, um, they are sealed up and sent most of them through the U.S. mail. Uh, in their, and the sealing process is very important because that maintains the chain of custody because they often become involved in litigation. And once we receive them, whether it's by mail or UPS, um, they're stored in a secure uh, cooling facility until they're tested by our chemists. My question is along that line also. What's the time frame? You said store, uh, they have a half life of six hours in, in industrial, what you just said on that chain of custody. Give us an idea of the timeline window that you have? Uh, yes. So uh, if you recall, the question is about the timeline that we have for testing that process. Um, and there are lag times in there. 
Uh, for example, it might take that three hour window for the blood to be collected. The kit gets packaged up, it goes into the, if, if the officer puts it in the mail right away, we might get it the next day. Uh, if, it's some, if it's a local municipality, for example, the city of Madison or Sun Prairie, and they get an arrest, they might just drive the kit to us and we'll get it within 24 hours of the blood being collected. The tubes themselves contain an anticoagulant and a preservative in them, so they do a very good job of maintaining the alcohol and many drug concentrations over time. Uh, and that being said, it, it, there isn't a risk of uh, the alcohol going up or the drug concentra concentration going up. Uh, it tends to dissipate over time, or uh, in the case of the heroin metabolite, it's going to hydrolyze to morphine. And so we might not see the 6-MAM if, if it's not tested in a timely manner. Um, once it's in that tube, though, it can be fairly stable. Um, we've had specimens that were uh, many months before they were tested because we had a serious problem with turnaround time due to lack of resources. And we were able to detect the 6-MAM in, in a long-term storage case case, they were stored in the refrigerator, so that does enhance um, the stability of the drugs and the alcohol as well. Yes, sir. Yeah. How many people, I mean, with the resources, or about how much resources do you have for these kinds of cases? I mean, is it a, is, do you have individuals who are doing nothing but these types of cases, or uh, could you give me an idea what those resources are and how many you would need, let's say, to keep up? Uh, the gentleman's question was how, how much resources that we need for testing and how many individuals do we have at the hygiene lab that perform this testing. Uh, the toxicology section has approximately 12 chemists that are actively performing testing. Um, we test uh, elk for alcohol in our casework on nearly every day. We can do um, anywhere from um, 90 to nearly 200 specimens a day for alcohol. Drug testing is, is much more labor intensive and much more resource taxing, both time, labor, and resources. It's expensive to do drug testing. Um, it's, it's very time consuming. Um, it requires uh, chemical, expensive chemicals so that you can extract the drugs out of the blood. And then if we identify a drug that's present, then because of our accreditation, we, we must perform a second test, so two independent tests to verify that that specimen does in fact have marijuana in it. It might screen positive for marijuana, but then that second test has to be performed. So um, you, we might have in poly drug cases uh, six to ten different drug tests alone that are performed on that specimen. So sometimes even the volume of blood that we get can be, can be an issue. Uh, for some people with, with IV drug addiction, if they don't have good veins, sometimes we get limited blood. As far as resources, uh, we part of the issue with you need people and manpower, but we need the instrumentation as well. So our workhorse instrument, the LC mass spec, mass spec that we use, we test all of our um, THC or our cannabinoids on there. And because remember, that's our number one drug. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases every year that need to be tested for marijuana. Uh, and it also tests drugs in that big family where alprazolam and Valium, um, those central nervous system depressants. And so we just are going through a period of time where that one instrument that we have has been um, not operational. And so those specimens are sitting in our cooler right now getting, getting tested. There are some state-of-the-art uh, instrumentation that our manager, Amy Miles, has been advocating for the hygiene lab to have for the last three years. Uh, many other forensic labs in the United States have them. It would be a tremendous screening tool because we'd be able to do one test and identify uh, hundreds of chemicals at the same time. So very efficient, uh, but again, it's, it's where, where do we get that funding? And, and that really is a sad argument for, well, if you don't have a good turnaround time, you don't have enough people, um, it, it boils down to, to money because you have to have dedicated individuals. And even when we get the instrument, we have to develop the methods so that we can provide 
high quality defensible data. Because remember, this data, that piece of paper, that toxicology report is going to be taken into court. And there are some high dollar defense attorneys out there that will try to shred it apart. And we produce high quality data at the hygiene lab. Um, and our chemists are highly trained, they're cross-trained, so we're very efficient. We don't just have one person that does one test. We have cross-training. Um, we have um, excellent training program in-house so that we can be as efficient as possible. Um, and then if you have people that are going to court, that's a person that is out of the lab not doing work. And as I said, we probably go to court two to three times a month. So if you have uh, 12 chemists two to three times a month, that's you know over one a day person out of your lab that's going to court. I hope that helps answer your question, sir. Yes, sir. Do you do testing just for uh, law enforcement purposes, or, or what about the samples that you get from, uh, say, treatment centers or, or hospitals or clinics or other sort of university sources? Or is it just a law enforcement related? Yes, our mission is for traffic safety, so just for law enforcement and for death investigations for coroner coroner and medical examiners, which is uh, fee-exempt testing. The hygiene lab does not have any funding for performing coroner and medical examiner testing. The OWI surcharge fund that comes from the fines that people pay, that is uh, a small pot of money that the hygiene lab gets funding from to um, offset our expenses for those. But, but yes, traffic safety is, we do often get asked for that. And, and, and we, ju we, just, we just can't. I don't know if that would ever change because our lab is very good at what we do, but um, right now that isn't in the foreseeable future. Um, yes, sir. You asked that this was an epidemic. There's no question when something is in the news is um, prevalent as this is, we've moved into a whole different area in terms of uh, impact on society. So yes, in my estimation, it's definitely an epidemic. And secondarily, another reason why it's an epidemic is um, we used to think of heroin abuse as being people that are at the extreme fringe of society. Now we see it embedded throughout society. There could be somebody down the street that you never would have expected before. And that's, to me, always a sign that something has gotten out of hand. Uh, yes, sir. Um, did you all hear this gentleman's comment? Yes, I, I agree. I do believe that it's an epidemic. It's constantly in the news. Uh, the one thing that, and this is my, my personal opinion here, not the hygiene labs, but the one thing that I find very disturbing, this is a very traumatic um, illness for families um, to, to witness with their loved ones, and it's tragic deaths of so many young people. But I, I, I'm frustrated because I, I don't hear um, any accountability for, for every, we have to be accountable for our actions. We have to take personal responsibility for the de decisions that we make. Um, if you get in your car and, and drive drunk, you are making that decision. Nobody is forcing you to do that. And nobody is forcing you to um, start injecting heroin either. And so, um, it, it, it's a, it is a huge society concern from both sides because we want to help these people and we want them to survive, but they have to want to help themselves as well. Um, I just watched an interview with an addict and the, uh, the officer was trying to convince her to, to go into a treatment program because there are some cities in the United States that uh, they give them the, uh, the option of instead of avoiding prosecution if they go into treatment because they don't want these people to go in, in, into jail. And oftentimes what happens is because now they've been in jail, they've gone through withdrawal, they've lost their tolerance, they come out and shoot up at their same dose and they're at risk for an overdose again. So this case where this woman was being interviewed, she just, she didn't want to dry up or dry out and quit drugs. She wanted to get in a methadone clinic because she wanted, she wanted methadone. So she wanted to still have something. And perhaps that would transition her into um, recovery later on, but uh, they, they have to want to be um, treatment and be drug free. Yes, sir. 
20 and 30 years ago, when crack cocaine was the epidemic, the response was to build prisons and more prisons and incarcerate everybody. What do you think has led to this change in looking at treatment and with much more compassion about the current epidemic? Uh, the question is um, referring to when crack cocaine was a problem 10 or 20 years ago and they were putting people in prison for that and asking why, why do I or why do we think that there's more compassion now with the current situation with the heroin. I'm, I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. One of the things that I think does affect it is when you have uh, celebrities or people of importance, and maybe that's um, in the political arena, I'll, I'll be very careful here that I don't say anything naughty, but uh, we, we have someone in politics in our own state that has uh, a child that is a heroin addict. And thank, uh, thank goodness, I hope that, that they're not driving um, because you, it, it brings that to the forefront and people have empathy when they hear that story. Um, there's a website called uh, The Fly Effect and if it's, uh, the current attorney general has something to do with getting that started several years ago, but The Fly Effect website has personal stories of family members and recovering addicts where they, they talk about how it has affected their family. And we're, we're in a media society, so everybody is looking for their information on the internet, and so perhaps it is more visible now. It's not hid in the closet where nobody tells anybody that their, their child is, is a junkie. Uh, we had a case here in Madison a few years ago, a death investigation case, where this was a young teenager who had their, their um, their boyfriend over on a Sunday afternoon just hanging out and just the boyfriend left and they stayed in their room and uh, the next morning the family found her in her closet. They, she overdosed on heroin, they didn't know that she was using it. Um, and so it's getting it out in the forefront and perhaps that will help people um, recover. Yes sir, in the back. Consider the answer to the previous question, racism? The question is, would I consider the answer to the previous question racism? Well, how about if I tell you this, that the largest population of heroin addicts in the United States are uh, ca Caucasian males from about uh, 22 to 35. That's the fastest growing demographic of heroin addiction. We're talking about 30 years ago. Oh, 30 years ago. Well, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that specific about the, the people that were addicts in those different times. Uh, there are different times in history where heroin, I mean, after Vietnam, many soldiers came back. That was a huge problem with uh, soldiers coming back addicted to heroin after Vietnam. And then even in the Civil War, they called it soldier's disease because they were on that laudanum, that alcohol um, morphine mixture. So it's, it's, it, it just recycles itself. It becomes what we think it, the heroin issue is because people became addicted to prescription opioids, whether that was their prescription or they snatched it out of somebody's medicine cabinet. Uh, and kids do that. We've had cases in our lab where young people have died because they got into the medicine cabinet for mom and dad's meds. And because they can't get those drugs anymore, they make the jump to heroin because it's cheaper, it's easy to get. Uh, an oxycodone tablet on the street is used to be worth about a dollar to two fifty a milligram. So that's a five milligram tablet. That's five to twelve dollars and fifty cents for that one tablet. I just recently heard that it's up to thirty dollars a tablet. So if you have a few oxys sitting in your cupboard that you didn't use after your back surgery and someone finds them in your medicine cabinet, that, that's worth some cash. Yes, sir. How much does a uh, lab spend sending uh, testing out of state? And what would it cost to upgrade the lab so you don't have to do that anymore? The question is, uh, how much does the lab send for sending specimens out of the state and what would it cost to upgrade us? Um, I'll take the first part of the question. Many times so the specimens that we send out of the state for testing 
are paid by uh, the Department of Transportation. So if there is, for example, a drug recognition expert has evaluated that subject and they determined that they are under the influence of one of those synthetic cannabinoids, the Department of Transportation supports the DRE program. They will pay for the hygiene lab to send that specimen out to Pennsylvania to the National Medical Service Laboratory for synthetic cannabinoid testing, which cost about $250 to $260. Um, if it's a death investigation for a, a drug that we cannot quantify the amount, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, amitriptyline. Are you guys familiar with amitriptyline? It's an old, old tricyclic antidepressant. It's very sedating. Uh, it's used very often now as a prophylactic treatment for migraines. And the theory there is uh, if you take that, it keeps you asleep so that you won't wake up with, with your migraine. But it's very sedating in drivers. We do not have a good method for quantitating the amount that's there. So we have controls, we kind of make a qualitative report and say it's present, but if it looks like it's really large in the testing, we have to call the coroner and say, okay, we, we think this could be possibly toxic or overdose. We have to send it to another lab and the coroners have to pay for it. So it doesn't really cost the hygiene lab money out of our funding uh, with the exception of the, the mailing fee. Uh, but it, it does spread the money, take the money out of our state. And in terms of updating our testing resources, the, that wonderful instrument that I mentioned earlier, um, it's called a QTOF for short, it's quadru quadrupole time of flight analysis. Uh, I think that's several hundred thousand dollars. It might, it might eliminate my job. They probably wouldn't need me anymore because they can just run the specimens through there and identify them. And then we, we would get a really big bang for our buck. Um, we could use another LC mass spec mass spec because the one that we have is down right now and we probably have a thousand specimens waiting to be tested for THC, maybe more, um, that have been sitting in our lab since November or December. So it's, it's, it's really difficult for us uh, to, to do our jobs without the resources. I mean, we are the public health lab. We are the, the hygiene lab is in the, the state constitution, and that's what our job is, um, is to protect the health and, of the citizens of Wisconsin. And, and our department just is one small player in that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, her question is related to the legalized marijuana in Colorado and what example and things are they learning from legalizing that drug. Well, my son lives out there and I hope it's not because of that, but I was out there last spring and what I can tell you, I did not see any empty buildings anywhere. I didn't see abandoned parking lots. Everything was full of people, restaurants upon restaurants. I mean, they are making money. Their state is bringing in money to their coffers, hand over fist. Uh, they do have resources where they set up uh, re rehabilitation for people that are addicts. But remember, they also have the medical marijuana. So they have to go to their doctor to get a medical prescription to have medical marijuana and then they can go to the dispensary to, to pick out their favorite flavor. But, and then that permit has to be renewed every year. So the state gets money for the permit, the physician gets money for the examination. So it's a very big money machine. On the flip side of that, they, they are very strict. They have very low, uh, any detectable amount of the parent Delta 9 in your system in the state of Colorado, you are prosecuted. They, they don't have uh, one, two, three 
uh, OWI offenses that are misdemeanors like Wisconsin, you are arrested and prosecuted. They are very strict. They have billboards out there that shows uh, plant material for marijuana. They show a prescription bottle and they show an alcohol bottle and they plaster it everywhere that if you are caught driving under the influence, you're going to be prosecuted and they're, they're very strict. So that could, I, in terms of the numbers, of how, if they're having increases in the number of their OWIs, uh, I, I gotta believe that Wisconsin is leading the nation right now. The state of Washington, I think, is coming up close to us, but, but we, we have excellent job security here in Wisconsin right now. <laughs> Any other questions?